Alternative Antiquity, Bleaching the Bones of World Literature. Gilgamesh was black. In October 1990, a professor of African studies at Cornell University named William B. Branch wrote a letter to the editor of the New York Times entitled, History Didn't Begin in Mesopotamia. In this letter, which enumerated, quote, the need for a sweeping curriculum overhaul, end quote, William stated, quote, early writing systems have long been known to have developed in the Nile Valley. In India and in other parts of Southwest Asia before writings codification as cuneiform and Mesopotamia by the early Sumerians, who were designated in later Assyrio-Babylonian inscriptions as the Blackheads or Blackface people. Sir Henry Rawlinson is said to have traced the Sumerians back to Egypt and Ethiopia, end quote. This editorial pointed out more than just the fact that ancient Sumerians were black. It also referred to how the public education system in the, United in the United States of America continues to make the erroneous claim that writing began in Mesopotamia. This is a demonstrably false narrative, which negatively impacts the ability of students to think critically about literature, history, and current events. According to culpability of the transatlantic slave trade, quote, Proto-Saharan, 5,000 to 3,000 BC, is the world's oldest known form of writing that was developed near the Karga oasis west of Nubia, end quote. This is just one of many African systems of writing that have largely been ignored by professors teaching from the perspective of the Western curriculum. There is a rich literary tradition throughout much of Africa, but the Western education system makes no note of this. In many cases, this is because of a lack of interest, but in some cases, this is due to the loss of source material and outright extermination. The destruction of African writings by Europeans is well attested to historically. And one example documented in Africa Writes Back, D. Vance Smith, a professor at Princeton University writes, quote, when the Romans destroyed Carthage in 146 BCE, its libraries of Punic literature were either burned or dispersed among nearby Numidian leaders. A few of these were later translated into Latin, although none of them have survived. And there are only allusions to what might've been in them, end quote. In a 15-week class of world literature at Los Angeles Trade Technical College, I did not take a single look at Africa or the great wealth of literature produced by any of the cultures within this large and diverse continent. This is a shame and a slap in the face to African-American students like me who must bear the brunt of anti-black racism within the Los Angeles Community College District and its nine colleges. The Epic of Gilgamesh serves as an important reminder that the American college curriculum is built upon a legacy of white supremacy and anti-black racism that diminishes contributions of Africans. Early European interest in Gilgamesh was fetishistic and sought to exoticize a people considered foreign to the colonial powers. So-called explorers from European nations like France felt justified in digging up the dead bodies and sacred sites of, sacred sites of ancient Mesopotamians to send the artifacts and corpses they stole back home to private collectors and museums. One example of these early explorers was Pierre Joseph de Beauchamp, who carried out the first European excavation in Mesopotamia. The East India Company not only trafficked in slaves, but also fa financed some of the early exploration in the field of Assyriology, like that of Claudius James Rich. One thing is for certain, the interpretation of the results of this field of study was influenced by the fact that every single founding member and early participant was a white male without exception. A. Leo Oppenheim, a professor of Assyriology at the University of Chicago in the 1960s wrote in Assyriology Why and How, quote, only by the towering stone columns of Persepolis and the highlands of Southern Iran could the attention of European travelers be eventually attracted, end quote. To Oppenheim and other Assyriologists, it was European fascination with the subject that made it worth study. In contrast, Africa, except for Egypt was ignored. Oppenheim writes, quote, can we determine in some way whether the work that has been going on for such a long time in the universities of Europe, America, and Asia made adequate use of that unrepeatable intellectual experience which fate offered Western scholarship through all these inscriptions? End quote. Here in this question, we can see the true nature of the study of Gilgamesh and Assyriology. The Europeans invested in this work see themselves as fated to a superior position, 
where they get to rewrite history and make the final claim on the significance of a culture of people whose writing they deem an offering to Western scholarship. It is of note that African universities are not mentioned alongside the Western ones by this professor at the University of Chicago. African American studi students like me, as a result, must either choose to assimilate to a system that is degrading and racist or to stand up and demand that sweeping curriculum overhaul mentioned in William B. Branch's 1990 editorial. American depictions of Egyptians and ancient Mesopotamians are a fair-skinned people that resemble Europeans or white people. The suppression of representation of black Africa in world literature leads to a void that must be filled by the students since the professors, academics, and administration have failed us. Chandra Chakraborty describes the Sumerians in a study in Hindu social polity, quote, Sumerians, as seen in the steles of Babylonia, as well as found in Memphis, were of dark brown complexion, chocolate color, short stature, but of sturdy frame, oval face, stout nose, straight hair, full head. They typically resembled the Dravidians, not only in cranium, but almost in all the details, end quote. When looking at Gilgamesh and the claims made about its origins in English 203, there were several things that needed to be taken note of. Writing began in Africa. Sumerians were black, and English 203 was devoid of black African writing due to a history of racism in English departments across the United States of America. Writing did not begin in Mesopotamia, but rather in Africa. The continent of Africa is the birthplace of humanity and the womb of human civilization. World literature, if nothing else, is a class about writing from around the world. It should go without saying then that some mention of the origins of writing should be made within this field of study. Any honest inquiry into the origins of humankind's ability to harness thoughts using written words must arrive at the destination of Africa. According to 15 Days of Black History, which was distributed by the Elmira City School District, quote, the first alphabet was developed over 5,000 years ago in the African country of Egypt. But long before that happened, the people of Africa used symbols to communicate, and this is called proto-writing. The world's oldest known form of writing is called proto-Saharan and can be found in the Karga Oasis in Africa. It really speaks to the heart of the problem when elementary school students in Elmira City School District have more accurate information about the origins of writing than community college students in Los Angeles, California. This censure of the truth in curriculum is not by accident, but rather by design. The university system was built for white men and the curriculum has not come to terms with the racist legacy of the American education system. Sumerians were black and their origins, like all homo sapiens, traced back to Africa. In Black Sumer, the African origins of civilization, Hermel Harmstein makes this very argument in a compelling way. Inspired by writers like Sheikh Anti Diop, Harmstein addresses what Assyriologists refer to as, quote, the Sumerian problem, unquote. This is the issue of the Sumerian language and where it originated from. Hermstein argues that the first Sumerians were indeed black Africans, despite a wealth of evidence proving that founders of many great civilizations worldwide were black Africans who migrated beyond Africa and brought civilization with them, Europeans refuse to believe the truth of this due to racism. When I attended the most recent King Tut exhibit in Los Angeles, California, I found it funny how the paintings were all black people, but the videos made by the museum starred white actors playing the roles of the black people depicted in the paintings and upon other artifacts. Europeans and white people in America and elsewhere live in a fantasy world where every great contribution was made by white people and black Africans were devoid of culture and literacy. The irony of the so-called Western perspective is that the Europeans they call civilized are some of the most savage and barbaric human beings to ever walk the face of the earth. By their own accounts, they were murderers, rapists, kidnappers, human traffickers, and thieves. Europeans have defaced ancient statues and reconstructed them to take away their resemblance to black Africans. They continue to lie about the origins of many great civilizations to cover up the fact that black Africans provided the basis for human civilization. English 203 was devoid of the presence of literature credited to black, credited to black Africans even though Africa has a wealth of literature to draw upon for inspiration, reflection, 
and literary criticism. There is really no excuse for this. There wasn't a single short story or book assigned to us by a black African author. We didn't learn anything about the literary contributions of any African writers. This may be because the professors themselves were not even taught the truth or because they want to suppress it. Either way, students deserve to read the contributions of great African authors throughout history. This usually doesn't happen because America's curriculum in English departments is racist. You can rest assured, however, that ancient Greeks will be well represented in the curriculum because later Europeans and American white people consider themselves related to the Greeks as white people. The lack of representation of African authors and inclusion of Greek authors has been challenged many times in the past, but curriculum refuses to change. Students today may not even realize the politics that shape what they study and learn. The lack of including Africa in the story of world literature is not done on accident. This is an example of racism and a reason why so many students like me lose interest in the material, grow sullen, and wish not to participate in a system that is clearly racist and discriminatory. Writing began in Africa. Sumerians were black and English 203 was devoid of black African writing due to a history of racism in English departments across the United States of America. Writing certainly began in Africa. This is not something that can be debated since the evidence clearly points out to an origin in the continent of Africa. Any claims to the contrary are fantasy and based in a desire to spread lies due to racism. Sumerians were black. The evidence is architectural, linguistic, and well attested to through various sources, which I have shared some of in this paper. African writing was not included in our class. This is due to a history of anti-black racism that has not been addressed. It is not just the classroom where we as students see this racism. If a student at Los Angeles Trade Technical College needs a loan, there are zero private loan servicers that offer this to Trade Technical College students. Go to Los Angeles City College, Pierce College, Santa Monica College, or other colleges in the same district that do not have as many black students and you will see that they all have loan servicers. If you want to get a loan through the government, Los Angeles Trade Technical College has their own special process set up that other colleges in the same district do not. This, according to the school, is to protect the students from themselves because we are low income in their eyes and lack financial literacy. It is code words for blatant racism because they don't want to give loans to poor students of color, especially black students. At a Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees meetings, they had a video played where white people made money fall on a black student, quote unquote, making it rain as a promotional tool to attract black students. Former student trustee Alfredo Gama stated that current chancellor Francisco Rodriguez said he didn't care about black student enrollment because they didn't bring as much money to the school district. When I confronted the chancellor about his comments in front of the only African American member of the board of trustees, he got angry and called Alfredo a liar. Why would a Mexican American student from Iguala Guerrero, who is not black, lie about a Mexican chancellor saying offensive anti-black statements behind the scenes? Francisco could not explain what the former student trustee would have to gain from lying about this. He also cannot explain the serious decline in black student enrollment during his time as chancellor. He also cannot explain the anti-black racism I as a student have experienced that has gone unaddressed despite me using every avenue available to complain and demand a change. The classroom should be the one place at the school where I can see inclusivity and equity. It is another place where black voices are silenced and white voices elevated and celebrated. Oh, 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 oh,